What's poppin' everybody? Hello and welcome to Popcorn Culture. My name is Ben Carlin and I am your host. Here with me today is my brother Jay, who will be in every episode. The other host, as they call me. We're not getting into it again. The other host. Jay Carlin here on Popcorn Culture. What's poppin' everybody? I've already said that. Yeah, I know. I was I was doing your thing. <laughs> oh, I see. I see what's happening. <laughs> You're trying to be me again. He's, he's are you mocking me? <laughs> He's trying to mock me. This is the sound of my voice. <laughs> oh, boy. Actually, that's kind of perfect, uh, leading right into our follow-up from our last episode. No. Where we... First, Benjamin, we need a corny joke. A corny joke. Yeah. Indeed. We can't skip. This is an integral part of popcorn culture. That we've done at least three out of eight times. No, we do it every time. Do we do it every time? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we don't. I'm wow. pretty sure. Okay, did you hear the one about the mathematician who's afraid of negative numbers? No. He'll stop at nothing to avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> you get it? Because <laughs> he gets to zero, then yeah. he's like, whoa. That's too much. That's too that's much. That's too much. That's too uh, much. Oh, that's a good one. Man, I hope we haven't been missing the corny jokes. You had one at the ready anyway. I had one. I had one. I No, I was completely ready for it. Yeah. Now, I always am. But if you don't ask me, like, I can't self-prompt myself, Jay. That's not what a good host does. Ben, Ben, I know what good hosts do. I, too, am a host of this show. <laughs> Whatever you say. No. Taking one's identity was a huge portion of our, uh, our last conversation here on The Pop, where we were discussing the phenomenon of, of delivering a, uh, a fandom or an interest or a hobby to one of your friends, and then that friend taking that hobby and taking it beyond where you had ever had ever right. had it. So, so by stealing identity, you don't mean like <clears throat> stealing someone's credit card or social security number. I certainly no. do not mean that. What we mean is you were a fan of something and you introduced it to a friend and they became such a bigger fan than you. They stole that part of your identity. They did stealing indeed. Stealing the fandom. I will say that in the last episode, as we were describing this, there was part of me that was like, what if this is the most unrelatable thing Ever, and we are just coming across as so petty and so selfish right now. I, I too had that idea. Like it's it's sort of like you're not in competition with anybody. Like I want everyone to win. Yeah. You know, like that that's sort of spitting in the face of that idea in its entirety. It's it's su suggesting that if someone else is more of a fan of something to you, then it lessens your fandom, which of course is not true. Which of course is not true, but we got so much feedback from so, people. So, so we totally hit on something here. Yes, yes. Yeah. For, for one, I want to start off by saying that one of the most fascinating things about this was to the extent that our YouTube channel, Super Carlin Brothers, was the object of this discussion. <laughs> where... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So people were fans of us on YouTube and introduced their friends. Most people who introduced, most people who messaged me said that they were introduced to our channel by one of their friends. They went down the rabbit hole and watched all of the early nitty gritty, cringy oh. stuff from start to finish. They've watched all of our gaming content, all the things. This is not me just plugging all of our other projects, though we do have many. Subscribe. Um, <laughs> what happened, though, is that their, their friends had introduced them to us, and then they had become such fans that they were aware of the pop before their friends were, who, oh. who had originally introduced them. Um, but the good news was under m many of the stories that people had sent in and told me, they now said that they were able to, uh, introduce the pop to their friends who had introduced them to Super Carlin Brothers. And now they're, they're happily enjoying it together. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Yes. Yes. So. I had, it's, uh, we've been doing the podcast for such a short amount of time that, I've had just one instance where in real life someone has come up to me where I didn't like know them as a personal friend and they were like just like a complete like um I was being introduced to someone and they were like oh I listen to your podcast and I was like what like it still baffles me sometimes that anyone watches anything we do no I I have the you same know what I mean? thing yeah the 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 experience of being uh, like like s semi internet famous. This is like the hardest thing to self proclaim. By the way, like like yeah, 
every all of our friends will always be like like they will refer to us as famous like very regularly i can never really tell if they're like kind of sort of like poking fun at like our strange and unusual job that is making content on youtube right um but it's it's the type of thing where we live in small town virginia that like we really don't experience the phenomenon that is you know being quote unquote famous right ever in the real world i mean occasionally the the lady who owns jimmy john's will, will be like i watch her channel by the way <laughs> yeah every every now and then someone will just mention that they like watch it certainly it's not like unsafe to walk down the street or something oh yeah no you know of course I mean? yes yes yeah I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it it's it's a weird I don't know if it's just because of exactly where we live. It, it is never it never it, like I, I, I'm never I'm not constantly being reminded that some people might consider us famous. And like, I don't I don't know. I don't know if when like certain people like I don't I don't ever feel that way. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. I, know. It, it, it is surprising to me every time that that somebody might have the the kind of almost like fanning experience upon meeting us in the wild um which actually just by by happenstance leads me into one of my conversation topics that i wanted to talk to you about today bring it on um which is the idea of fangirling over anybody or whether or not because frequently for me when it happens or when i'm having like a fanboy moment i don't think i could have told you walking into the room that i would have had this reaction to meeting someone who i have known primarily through a screen mm -hmm. um and so I, I would say that there are that there would be a small list of people that I think if I met in person that I would actually fan like fanboy over. Um, although I also know from personal experience that like the first time John Green was like over there, I was like, oh, my God, it's John Green. <laughs> like, like, he's in the room. I'm in the same room right now. Um, and, and I don't even know if it was the proper uh, experience, but I was very excited to like have had that, you know, come to come to pass and, and like be there. Right. Is is there anybody that either you have had a particular fanboy experience with or that, you know, that if you got to meet them, that you like that your face would melt off? Oh, man. Well, I guess I have a few stories regarding uh fa fangirling or fanboying if you will okay that's another question for you i tend to say like fangirl as as like the term in my mind um to me okay ooh, this is i'm only just realizing this right now to me if it's over a person you're fangirling if it's over a product you're fanboying oh weird is that right like you're like an apple fanboy but you're yeah. like a Justin Bieber fangirl. I sort of get that. I sort of get that. Okay. It's it's almost like like dude. You know, like I, I can use like dude interchangeably. Yeah. In the same way that I feel like I, I a, a man, would fangirl over meeting like Daisy Ridley. Sure. That sounds right. Like fa like the the girl, I think this is a weird situation where girl or boy attached to it has nothing to do with the gender. It has to do with the object or person with whom you are fanning yeah yes so you can say fangirl but it has nothing to do with being male or female it's just an overexcited reaction to meeting a human whereas fanboying is an overexcited reaction to a like product or show or something sure sure that that okay i'm just this is how I've never put this together in my head, but as I think about it, that is how I use those terms. Well, so and I was the same way. Like you may even hear uh, if you're if you're to scrub back and listen to me setting up this particular topic, I, I corrected myself like every time I went to say a, a fanboy moment, uh, because my my instinct, my knee jerk reaction is to say fangirl moment right and i was like no i guess because because i'm a guy it's a fanboy moment maybe but but i don't actually stand by that at all but i also have no reason f for backing anything anyway it's just sort of the term as i know it in my head right so i have no idea okay well that'll be interesting i wonder if the the little colonels use fangirl and fanboy in the same way or, do, you, do you use both? Is it a gendered thing or is it just like, like, dude? 
I th like no, I I wouldn't use them interchangeably. Okay, okay. So okay, so let's say like Look, our our cousin Rachel, for example, mm -hmm. like gets a new Apple iPhone, right? The eleven Pro Max, right. which I just got over the weekend. Yeah. Um, does she have a fanboy moment over her excitement of opening? Right. So yes, even if you are a if like if our if our cousin Rachel is loves all things Mac and she buys the new computer and has a new iPhone and gets the new laptop then I would call her a, a, like an Apple fanboy interesting okay yeah. okay yes that's how it goes okay so fanboy for products fangirl for people people yes okay I'm I'm so desperately wanting to hear uh, everyone's feedback here also I want to adamantly state that I would not firmly stand on anything and if we're so ridiculously wrong for any of these assertions just let us know and we'll we will correct of course <laughs> <laughs> this is just like I don't I've never noticed the use of these phrases in this way in my own personal just it, like internally so I don't know if other people do use do it the same way that I do but I think that is how I uh how I do it okay but okay. in any case let me describe to you some of my own personal fangirl moments okay lay them on me okay because I think I've gone through a lot of iterations okay with this and I've had perhaps some unique experiences or opportunities um in this world sure Okay, so I think the first time I ever had the opportunity to really fangirl over something, or the time that I was like, oh my god, this person is famous, was being introduced to simply anyone who was famous. Like, I, like if you have never met any celebrity before, then I think you are probably on some level going to fangirl a little just by the nature of being around someone like that. The the general recognition of the moment when you see a person from across the way and you're like, that's the person from from whatever. From the thing. This, so, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So um, after I graduated college, before I had like a full-time job or anything, I was working on a movie set, which was being shot here in the local Virginia area at Smith Mountain Lake. Okay. The movie was called Lake Effects. Uh, you're welcome to go check it out. My name appears in the credits. Does it really? It does. It does. Locations assistant, Jonathan Way to Carlin. go, man. Yeah, Congratulations. Right. So I'm on this movie set, and it's it's like a Hallmark-style movie. I think that's where it landed. I don't think it made it to theaters or anything. Um, but... And that's the kind of movie it is. But they had, you know, real big name actors in it. I'd say the, the biggest name actor there was uh, Jane Seymour. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're there. I was there several, uh, like probably for like a week or so before shooting actually started. And a lot of what my job entailed was, you know, getting all the, the, the trailers that they would be, you know, spending time in in between shots like just parked and ready and like hooking up all of the the stuff to the trailers sure which super glamorous work let me tell you hey you made it into the credits that's right this is all it takes um but so i think the first at, at one point or like i my personal role as part of the movie crew didn't involve dealing with the actors or actresses very much at all sure like i was like barely above like a production assistant okay if that at all i was not being paid <laughs> to be there this is all experience based um but it just so happened that at one point i was the guy near the golf cart and the way the set and like the trailers were set up was that the set was in this house at the bottom of the hill and all the trailers are at the top of the hill. So anytime they need one of the actors, they have to send this golf cart up the hill to pick them up so they don't have to walk. Right, yeah. And they drive them down. So I'm the person near the golf cart, and they're just like, they need someone on set. They, they need, like needed another take or something. The person who's supposed to be doing isn't there. So they're like, Jonathan, can you go pick up uh, Madeline? And I was like, oh my god. What? I was like petrified nervous about this, because like, 
I've never been around a famous person before. This is like one of the stars of the movie. Uh, the actress's name was Madeline Zima, who I'm not sure if you're familiar with. I'm not. I'm no. going to look her up, though. Well, let me tell you, I don't I don't think she's like a super duper huge deal, big actress or anything. But I did know of some of her work at the time in college. Maybe one of the first shows I was ever like an enormous fan of that we did like theories on and stuff was the show Heroes. Yes. Right? Yes. Is she in Heroes? She is in Heroes. No. Yeah. So me and Ben used to, or Ben used to host these Heroes nights at his apartment in college. Chilly night. Chilly night. Yeah. Yeah. It was fantastic. We'd all drive over from Tech to Radford and we'd have chili and Ben would make uh, tortilla chips, homemade tortilla chips. Homemade. Oh, man. Yeah. The best. Yes. Also so easy to make. Yeah. 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 Also, your apartment smelled like straight up fry royal. Yes, it, it all was, the time. It was like a McDonald's, and I lived inside of it, and yeah. I was so absurdly <laughs> nose blind to it that like this is one of those things where I would like show my apartment off to people yeah. and have. I had no idea that it smelled this way mm. until our friend Mike one day was like, "Oh my god, I hate being in your apartment. It smells so bad." And I was like, "No, like." I, this is this is like a glass shattering moment in my life where I, I don't know if I could have been more disappointed to have found out that something that I had been proud of, I was completely not realizing was like kind of embarrassing. Uh, I'm sorry on your behalf. That's OK. That's OK. Anyway, so, so anyway, Madeline, Madeline Zima from Madeline Heroes. Madeline Zima. So, yeah, even even within the context of the show Heroes, which is they're unfamiliar with, was a super popular show on NBC for like two seasons and then had a really slow, slow death. Of which I was there for every minute. I was a champion of this show to the bitter end. And it got pretty bad towards the end. But I think around like season four, the the big thing from Heroes was save the cheerleader, save the world, right? So the cheerleader character played by Hayden Pantier, her character Claire goes to college and her roommate is Madeline, is Madeline Zima. Zima. No way. Yeah. Okay, now that I'm seeing her, I'm completely remembering this right. perfect lady. And the roommate's not a big character. She's like... She ends up, I think, being a love interest of Claire, sort of, throughout the season. But I think she ends the season dead. And she doesn't have any powers. So, yeah, not a huge deal. But me, Ultra Heroes fan, is now being tasked with driving Madeline from her trailer to the to the set. And I remember just having no idea how to interact with this person. And the answer to how to interact with these people is to treat them like exactly normal people, which is what they are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm just like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. This is this is so good. So she introduces herself to me like a completely normal person. <laughs> She's like, hi, I'm Madeline. And I was like, I think my words to her were, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. Oh, my God. That's what I said. No, it wasn't. I was, I'm embarrassed to even think about it. I was like, oh, that was so lame. That was so dumb. Jay, I have lived with you for years. We have worked together every single day for years. Yeah. And you have never told me this story. Because it's so embarrassing. It's so you're welcome, podcast listeners. Um, yeah, that was that was my first time like ever like fangirling was on this 30 second golf cart. Right. And of course, I'm driving the golf cart as well. So I'm like, no. Don't don't mess up driving the golf cart. Was it like driving like when when like a police officer is like driving behind you? And, it was and it was like your legs kind of go numb, and I'm just like, oh my god, this is like, oh man, I don't know what to do. And let me just say that I had a, a different bad experience with the golf cart prior to this. Oh no! Like, yes. Why did they let you near the golf carts? <laughs> golf carts, if you don't know, are like the easiest thing in the world to drive. Um, but I happened to be shuttling something down uh to from from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill and on this particular day on set they needed to move the camera from the house to the lake and if you're familiar with smith mountain lake you know that many of the houses even if you are not 100 feet from the lake are also still about four stories above the lake <laughs> Right, right, yes, yes. So there's often extremely steep stairs right. to get from house to lake. This house, no exception, except that these people were very uh, wealthy, and they had a golf cart path as well. Sure. Went, yeah. As so you do. I get down, shuttling whatever I needed from the golf cart from the top of the hill to the bot, just to the house, at which point my plan is to go back up the hill and return the golf cart. Okay. But whilst I'm down there, the guy holding the camera 
who has the camera for the movie, which is like one camera, and it's a it's a red, which is like a really expensive kind of camera. I want to say it's like minimum fifty thousand dollars. How much is a red camera? Google, go. Yeah, go. What do you got? It looks like options just just for the base, not yeah. including a lens, are about fifty four thousand dollars. Okay, so this would have been like yeah, the whole movie's being shot on this camera, and the guy. Is holding it and he just plops down next to me and it's just like, can you take me to the bottom of the hill? Like, oh, you're the guy driving the golf carts and I need to get somewhere using the golf cart. Can you just take me to the bottom of the hill? This is interesting because in this moment, you are living inside of what is overall an extraordinary situation for yourself. Yes. He, on the other hand, has probably been in this exact situation so many times and you are a normal fixture of I'm this just environment. Like an, I'm just like an intern. I'm just golf cart guy. Right, right, right. right. You know, he's like, just like, yeah. He's probably met a thousand golf cart guys in his yeah. life. He's just like, uh, I need to get to the, I'm, I'm moving the camera. Who is in the golf cart? There it is. I'm just, you know, go or whatever. So anyway, though, I, one, have to find the little hill, which is like just nestled right next to the side of the house between some bushes and the house literally only wide enough for the golf cart and then i start going down the hill and it is just simply too steep for the like for the brakes no it isn't like we are going down the hill and i see the turn coming and i'm like I'm, my foot is pushing the brake the whole way down and it's just not stopping and i'm like oh my god I do not know what to do. And the guy is like looking at me like, dude, stop, turn. And I'm like, I like, I do not know eventually what happened. They're like, the, it like forked off to the right. And I just like turn the steering wheel into it. The brakes are not working. And I think as I turned the cart, the like gradient leveled off a little bit enough for the brakes to start working. And it just comes to a screeching halt. And we're only about halfway down the hill. And the guy just <laughs> looks at me gets off the car and says, I'll walk it the rest of the way. And I was like, oh my God, that sucks. No. Yeah. I was just like, I I am not the golf cart guy. <laughs> what a terrible, no, that is, that's like, that's someone else failed somewhere along the lines. Like the brake shouldn't fail. Oh, I know. I know. I'm like, I, I, I was just like, what, what am I supposed to be doing? I, you know, and it shouldn't be that hard. Golf carts are so easy to drive or whatever. But yeah, so that was, anyway, that was my other experience with the golf cart. Uh, at at Lake Effects. So, so you crushed it. I totally crushed it. <laughs> if anyone's seen the movie Lake Effects, please let me know. Uh, just because I don't think I've met many people who <laughs> have seen the finished product. Oh uh, man, it would be so funny <laughs> if in the credits there was like a little star next to your name, and at the bottom it was like, "Do not let drive golf cart ever again." <laughs> I don't. The thing is, it wasn't like this spread around or anything. It wasn't like everyone was like staring at me the rest of the time, like, "Oh my god, that's the guy who almost crashed the camera." Or, or were they? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, I'm aware of. Okay, thankfully, I was also not on set. For the duration of the whole movie, which I think was going to take about a month to shoot. But I was only there for about two weeks uh, because in that time I got hired for an actual my, like the the like a real full time job in an office and stuff. But at that job, I was the uh, like uh, one of the marketing people at a concert venue. Right. So kind of a unique position to be in. Kind of a unique position to be in if for no other reason that it allowed me access or the opportunity to meet just so many famous people. Right, in the weirdest way imaginable. Like, it's it's a... Not, I don't want to say that it was like an easy job or anything like that, but it, it within the building, it is like the entry-level marketing position job, right? Yeah, there were two marketing positions. There was the director, and then there was me. Right, okay, yeah. yeah. So, like, all things considered, though, you're, you're in your, like, first job, which then all of a sudden grants you this kind of, like backstage VIP experience access to like every major act that comes through. Like if you imagine the dollar figures involved with paying for the VIP experiences to meet all of those people, like it's a really unusually like high yield job perk. It, if, it, if you are super into those things. Yes. Yes. That was sort of the thing. Like all of a sudden. And so what, what comes through Roanoke a lot is country music. Right. So I got to meet many a country star and i think it was going through this like weirdly over time you just like i guess sort of adjust to it or maybe like 
Man, like when I met Madeline, for example, the first time I've been around a famous person ever, no mm -hmm. idea what to do. So as I started working though at this venue, like if it was someone I was like a true, real, huge fan of, it was kind of like I would still maybe get those jitters. But if it was just a, an act coming through, it's it far it stopped being such a big deal. You kind of got desensitized. All. Yeah, you get a little desensitized to it. That's fascinating. That's yeah. fascinating. I don't know that. I don't know that I've interacted with so many people. There, there is something to be said. Um, like so through through YouTube, we've been to VidCon and and various you know playlists live. We've been to NerdCon, uh, and and with that sort of backstage of all these events is like an area where everybody's sort of congregating and drinking like a bottle of water or coffee or you yeah. know having like a breakfast cookie or something like that. Yeah. Um, the Marriott has the best breakfast cookies, by no the way. Doubt. Do you I recall? They were really good. Breakfast I do cookies. recall we did go on them like every day. Yeah. Dude, actually speaking of those, they were like they were like just like a sugar cookie with like the hardened icing on top. Do you know yeah. what I'm talking about? Like <laughs> yeah, what, they were not that fancy. But what is so great? I, I, I don't know what it is about the hardened icing on top of these sugar cookies, but but I love it. Yeah. It's like it like cracks when you bite into it. it. That is. I, it has a good snap. It, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to know how to do that, which I bet is not hard. I bet that it it's a pretty low hanging fruit. I bet it's very easy, especially because these are the kind of cookies I think they just put out in the lobby on repeat forever as like a welcome to the Marriott. <laughs> yes, I think that's true. I think that's true. So yeah. certainly they're cranking them out. Yeah. <laughs> and as someone who has actually like successfully made okay-ish like macarons, hmm. I feel like I should be able to execute hardened dicing. You'd think. And yet I, I to this day, not, so, not in a way that I'm proud of. So is your story going towards someone you fangirled over at a VidCon or a NerdCon? Well, no. So I think I think sort of my general sense of it is that through my experience with YouTube, I have always felt like I am the the most unusual person to have made it into the place of being a YouTuber because I was never like a fan mm -hmm. of YouTube prior to doing it with you. Like I didn't even have a baseline for what other YouTubers did in mm -hmm. their videos when I started. Like, right. I, it's not like I had like watched years and years and years of content and was like, okay, like I kind of know like what the jokes are and what the editing's supposed to look like and how many images you should use or anything like that. Like I had, I had no idea. And so very frequently I have felt like I'm in this room where I am very actively aware of the fact that tons and tons and tons of people would be so excited to meet most of the people in the room. Yeah. And I have no idea who they are. <laughs> oh, I see. You're in like a reverse effect. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. It's like, it's like, I know that these people are all big time YouTube celebrities and yet they 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 do come across as completely normal people. In some ways I have found <laughs> that because maybe that's your position, it is that much easier for you to find yourself in the middle of a conversation with other people though. I do think that's true because I do think that there is something to be said for putting people like on a pedestal and oh, then yeah. having no idea how to have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. And if I can legitimately go up to them and be like, what do you do? Tell me about your channel. Right. <laughs> like It's like I get to start having a conversation with them and I... I'm not sure that they would expect you to know what I don't they do. think they would because I, well, and this is just maybe me seeing the world through my own lens, but I would never expect anyone to know what we did. Exactly, exactly. Even though we're all there for the same reason on the same platform and people have come up and said like, oh, I like your stuff before. I'm like, no, I don't think you're right. You must be mistaking me. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So it, I think I think for me, it has always been helpful uh, to not know who these people are. But then as a result, I feel like sometimes I'm almost missing out on the excitement associated, like kind of like we were saying with mm -hmm. your job at the, at the Berglund Center where you had this unusual job perk of like, you know, meeting Carrie Underwood. And it's like, that's kind of cool. That was one of the people I got to meet. Yeah. Not, not, not to humble brag. Not to like humble brag or anything. I don't want to like name drop my long list of <laughs> country music stars. <laughs> but I have photos if you'd like but, to see them. <laughs> That was a weird thing is that <clears throat> when I started working there, one of the rules I was told was like, if you were in a picture, not to share it on social media or something. Oh, right. 
for no other reason that it might make other people on staff like like jealous or feel like they were not being treated as well and we're not, and like I was told this by like my the other marketing person, the director of marketing when I got there like in the first week and I was like, okay, whatever, that makes sense. And she did not last long as my boss. Okay. But I just like internalized this rule as like, yeah, okay, whatever. And I remember like leaving and one of their parting gifts was all these photos that like I had been in as like, you know, part of like the meet and greet with the the people the staff at the venue and I was like, oh man, I can like finally post all these photos I've gotten. They're like, what do you mean finally? Because like I had a new boss by then, and I was like, well, I guess like I was told we were never we weren't supposed to post them. They were like, that's not a rule. No, oh, no. <laughs> I was like, what? What? What so, is this? So someone who was only there for a few months after your hire literally dictated something that like resonated with you for so long that you were actually making decisions. Well, after she was gone. Oh, this was this was such a problem of my employment. There was that. I, I don't want to get into it or, or like too much or anything, but basically I would later find out that the the reason I was hired was to bridge the gap between my immediate supervisor and the next person who was going to take her job. Okay. Right. Like they, they, they just needed someone there while they replaced that position. Oh, wow. But in the meantime, this person they wanted to get rid of was training me oh <laughs> you know no. what i mean so right. like you know there was a bunch of stuff that i was told that i just just like these are the rules i'd never had a job before <laughs> you know and then then I, you'd get caught in these situations like two or three years later where most of the stuff maybe you'd have figured out like okay that was just sort of a, a that person thing right but that like i remember being asked specifically like why why do you do it this way and i'd be like because so and so and it would just be like oh <sighs> It oh, strikes again. It strikes again. You were so young and impressionable. Was, exactly. And like, and like everything stuck with you. And then it's just like, none of this is useful. None of it was useful. I was taught the rules for the wrong game. I was taught to, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it was like someone told me how to play the game wrong, but I was like, these are the rules. Anyway, I, I feel bad. I don't want to harp on that um, too much or anything. Sure, sure. Um, I, will, I've not, I, I would say the weird thing about having gone to all these conventions with you is that even though you don't know that many people that I feel like in some ways when you do recognize someone, I feel like you do freak out a little more. Do I, who have you seen me meet that I fr froked over? Froked over. I remember we walked past, uh, Joe Beretta one time we in the did. lobby. You're so right. VidCon. Yeah. Okay. So Joe Beretta, uh, was from, he, he was eventually on source fed and now the Valley folk. Yeah. Um, but way back when he was on a channel called Barretts and Beretta, and this was before it ever occurred to me that it wasn't like production studios creating comedy content on the internet. This was like two dudes creating content on oh, the internet. Oh, that is what that was though. <clears throat> right. Barretts and Beretta. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And, um, but so I, I remember like watching this as content that like, I wouldn't sit down and binge YouTube videos or anything like that. It was literally just like the content that the people in my life had like been like, oh my God, you have to watch this video. Yeah. And like sat me down. And so like I had seen and had known who that was since like high school or something. Yeah. I mean, it was like it had been so long since I had first been exposed to who Joe Beretta was. And so I remember he was walking past us on the way to the elevator and I was like... <laughs> I was like, Joe Beretta. <laughs> I turned around. I'm like, huge fan. <laughs> oh, so bad. So you're so right. I completely forgot about that, which is mm -hmm. weird because it's like a moment. Maybe my brain like blocks out the moments when I'm embarrassed uh -huh. so that like I don't have to go back and. I think that's totally a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Someone else will bring it up and be like, oh, yeah. Don't uh, talk about that. Yeah. I would say. So I think for me, and I think we had two encounters like this but the 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 last time we went to vidcon i found it, it was really fun i felt like i didn't feel like this nearly as much i felt like much more like part of the crowd i guess however um the two people there who i was like really freaking out to potentially meet were uh Rhett and link yeah because me and beth love good mythical morning on youtube we watch it literally every day and like we kept we kept sort of seeing them around at the last VidCon. Yes. And the one the year before that, 
we'd like ridden an elevator with them. Right. And you, I think even you knew who Red and Link were. I did. I yeah. Did. And so we're standing in the elevator. They walk in. I think I, I just like completely froze. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. This is so cool. And well, we didn't say anything to him. Because <laughs> I think I started talking to someone else in the elevator who they knew also. Sure. But um, this year in particular, uh, we were in the Snapchat lounge backstage and uh, we we actually got to like talk to them for maybe like three or four minutes. And that was like one of the coolest things I felt like that happened. And Rhett complimented my shoes and I was like, oh man, that was really cool. <laughs> Which, not for nothing, but I gave you those shoes for Christmas, yeah, yeah, and you, you didn't did. give me any credit at all. Like, <laughs> I, I think the way, if I remember the conversation, is that I, they're, they're, the shoes in question are these, like, rainbow, they're called, the, the brand is called Noble. Noble. And it's spelled like N O B U L L. Yes. They're so, like CrossFit or workout shoes. They're like workout but they're, but they're shoes. really cool looking. Yeah, right. So it's I think it, it, the way I've always interpreted the title is that it's supposed to be like noble, like, you know, like, oh, these are like really they'd like the shoes have high integrity. But then also it's like there's no bull. I think like, that's I think it's exactly what yeah, they're like, going for. There's yeah. like no bull in the gym. We're here to work out. Right, right, right. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway. They're really cool. I get compliments on the shoes all the time. And I think he said, oh, dude, I love those shoes. And I think because you bought them, you started spouting off some of the specs. And we're like, yeah, they're knife proof. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought that was the type of thing that Rhett and Link would find fascinating. I think he did. <laughs> but then he's like, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't remember much of the conversation. Did you black out? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Oh, I was so excited to meet them. It's so funny. I the, that that was one of those moments where I like as soon as we like engaged in conversation with them because they were definitely trying to have time with their families. And, For sure. Um, I had like an immediate timer where it was like no more than ninety seconds. Like like yeah. yeah it's like it's like we need to like be like hey so nice to meet you guys we always wanted to this is really cool your yep. show is great <laughs> see ya <laughs> have a great day but they were very nice. Uh, in the in the short time we talked to them, so those are those are my my fangirl moments. The fangirl moments that, okay. that stick out to me in my mind. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. So for me, this this was going back to my my early aquarium days. So basically, um, <clears throat> like in in high school, my first job was at like a Petland, and then after that, I when I was eighteen, mom, dad, and I actually bought like a local retail store called Ultimate Aquariums. Right. Uh, which is actually still around to this day, but it was like a saltwater specialty store. And so that was like legit. You know, I used to shop there and then I went to own it and it was like, this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, were you refed you going over your own retail store? A little bit, yeah. a little bit. Like when I was like standing behind the register, it was sort of like a strange badge of honor mm -hmm. because like I had walked into there so many times and like asked advice so many times. Uh, and so it was like really cool to like be at the helm of it. Um, but anyway, so like all through college, I'm sort of like, you know, working and, and like running this like little retail store. And uh, when we graduate, I go and do this like crazy internship with like this company called Reef Aquaria Design out of Florida who does like insane, legit aquariums. Okay. Like, like in penthouses, like I got to work on a tank in the penthouse of Trump Tower in like Miami or something like that. And the tank was so big, they had to bring the individual pieces of glass up in the elevator and assemble the tank in the room because they couldn't get it in through a window or a balcony or any other way. Big tank. Big tank. Uh, or like we, I've literally watched them drop like a 6,500 gallon cylinder through the roof of a building before they put the roof on because that was going to be the only way to get it in there. That was in Lexington, Kentucky. Jellyfish. Um, but anyway, so I was really big into the aquarium scene and got to do like so many cool things with it. But the whole time this TV show is becoming popularized called Tanked on, I think it was on Animal Planet. Um, I remember that show. Yes. And so for me, I always looked at Tanked similarly to how like maybe a like car enthusiast might look at like pimp my ride where it's like right. pimp my ride it's it's not what they're doing isn't remarkable but like turning an old station wagon into like a ski ball game that can actually drive is like it's fun and whimsical but other like 
car people aren't going to look at that and be like respect you know like <laughs> like that's not the type of thing that ends it, up like in, it's like good tv not good cars exactly yeah. exactly and i think that that's always sort of how i viewed tanked like they always did these like very over you know um overly dramatic versions of how an aquarium installation might go and oh no this isn't gonna work what are we gonna do um but then I remember being at my my very first aquarium convention. It's so weird that all these happen at conventions. Um, <laughs> well, this is where you would often meet these, these people, kind of people. Of course, yeah. yeah. So I remember I was like backstage because I was I was working the convention, helping set up for the the company that I worked for, and. Um, Brett and Wade walked out and it was like I had been the biggest jerk in the world towards the idea of the TV show tanked. Like I would have dogged it left, right, sideways, you know, like right. I was like, that's not a legit show. That's not how you do it. And Brett and Wade are the hosts of the show. Brett and Wade are the hosts of the show. Okay. And so they come walking around the corner and I like jaw drop. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like the biggest hypocrite on the planet because I was like, because even in the moment, I was like refusing to let myself be excited about or like even running over and like saying hello or like right. introducing myself or something. Uh, Cause I was like, no, I'm too cool for that. But in reality, I thought it was insanely cool that they were there. And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, I had to eat a, a bowl full of something. Yeah. I don't know what the saying is. You're close to it. Mashed cranberries. Yes. You had to eat a bowl full of mashed cranberries or maybe grapefruit. Not grapefruit. Not, not grapefruit. <laughs> Did you know that in Sweden, grapefruits are just called grapes? I do know that because I read the same comment we got about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and though, wait, I want to find the word because the amount of times like Scandinavian words have come up on this show. What is the word for grapefruit? Because I put it in the show notes. Hold on. This comes from uh, Little Colonel Felix, and they are talking about how grapefruits in Sweden are indeed just called grapes, and they didn't understand that in English, this was not the same phenomenon. So they have the reverse problem. Um, but in fact, Swedish grapes, like what you might, what we think of as grapes, are called vindruvor, vindru oh, vindru oh. vindruvor, vindruva, vindruva? vindruva? singular. I'm sure I'm saying this wrong. It's like, Do you eat yeah, them on Isan Von Pavia Day? I cannot believe you're about to say Isan Von Pavia Day. Oh my gosh. Were you saying that correct? Did anyone respond? Some people responded to my version of, was it Norwegian Valentine's Day? Is yeah, that, is that I think where, that's what it yeah, was. where it was. Isan Von Pavia Day. Isan Von Pavia Day, um, a.k.a. the name of our new Friendsgiving. Friendsgiving in, on Valentine's Day. On Valentine's Day, because what you should really do is have a holiday to celebrate your friends. Exactly. Um, People said that they have heard worse. So, you know what? I'm going to call it a win. I'm going to say, I'm going to call it a win, but also say, no, you weren't saying it right. I think that, well, you know what? They said hey. I, they said they heard worse. So Okay. Let me, okay. So this is something I was thinking about the other day that you just reminded me of. And I want to know if you feel like this was a real effect or not. Because in my brain, this is a real thing that happened. But I call this the dodgeball effect. Okay. Okay. The dodgeball effect is the result of the movie Dodgeball. You remember this movie, right? I'm sure. Yeah, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dodgeball, I think, came out in like 2006, I want to say. Uh, maybe the summer of 2005, starring Ben Stiller and Vince Vaughn. Yes. Right? Let's see here. What year did it come out? It 2004, makes, American sports comedy film. Okay, it makes me really make feel really <laughs> old that I have to explain maybe what the movie Dodgeball is, but it occurs to me that it's been about 16 years. So there are like teenagers out there who maybe have never seen it, which is a huge mistake. You should go to, totally go see Dodgeball. Oh, we're becoming those people. We're becoming those people. Um, but this movie was like... Huh. It came out the same movie, the same summer as the year uh, as the movie Anchorman, and these two movies I feel like singularly changed a lot of comedy, like the future of comedy movies. I would agree a, with that in a big way, but I feel like Dodgeball in particular, um, made invented like this genre of stuff that would be like hyper specific to an obscure thing like hyper specific you, to an obscure thing yeah so like tanked for example i feel like as a result of the dodgeball 
Oh, interesting. Right. Like, like people were like, oh, this is a, a thing I sort of know exists, but then it would be like celebrated in such a huge way. Like in the same way that like, oh, Dodgeball the movie took a sport that's largely just a gym class thing and like treated it like it was an international phenomenon. Right. You know? Right. And everyone plays Dodgeball and people, there's huge leagues and it's taken super seriously on ESPN8, the Ocho, uh, or whatever. Uh, but it was also sort of making fun of it in the same way. Like right, it was right. a huge deal, but also extremely obscure at the same time uh yeah, yeah. obscure sports quarterly yeah, yeah, yeah. quarterly yeah ex- obscure sports quarterly so i feel like the effect was that obscure hobbies became like the subject of uh a lots of tv shows or other movies like then you had movies like semi pro which was about like amateur basketball or like the ballad of ricky bobby which was like nascar or like there was all these like obscure sports specific movies and i feel like it trickled down into other stuff and stuff like tanked became like a reality because of that movie so you would say that like going back to it the the quasi butterfly effect Mm -hmm. it's almost like because something like dodgeball existed yeah if not for dodgeball then the TV show tanked never happens. Right. Like the, like promoting an obscure hobby or sport became like a really trendy, popular thing. Interesting. Is what I, I feel like was the effect. Okay. Do you think that there's anything to this? Because this is something that I love about hobbies is learning that there's like this entire living, breathing ecosystem mm-hmm. of fandom around something that is always there at all times. And you have no idea how deep it goes yeah. until you start stepping into that world. Mm-hmm. Like that is sort of something that I think I have seen over and over and over again For like sure. like where where i will have like heard of something or like board game stores to me is like one of these things where i'm like how on earth does that stay in business like there's a board game aisle at target why do we need a whole store right but then when you start digging into like people who are into board games and like the miniatures and like all the different like tabletop card games anything you can play it's like a vast network of people who are like deeply involved in this for sure this was something where i went to school at radford university which is like like i say we live in small town virginia now like in roanoke radford is like smaller town virginia right like it's it is a itty bitty town and this one i went to radford last weekend i was just driving around with alice because we both went there and one store, the it may even be the only store that is still the same store as when I was in college, where I was equally as befuddled, was a board game store oh. on Main Street. And I was like, really? That's the business that has survived since 2008, at least, mm-hmm. when I went to college. Yeah. I'm not gracious. surprised. Yeah, I know, I know. But yeah. like, but I would have had no idea. Even then, I was like, I was baffled. I was like, in my mind, it's like there must be some other explanation. That's like that. That is the reason why a store like this could exist because I, I, I don't get it. Right. Like you're, you're so far removed from that world that you don't understand. Like an entire world exists in there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. And like people do things and have activities. Right. Yeah. Like okay. People plan their weekends and nights and evenings around doing this thing right and it like doesn't even cross your mind to something you would ever do well other than you inviting me to do it all the time well yeah yeah i've become one of those people <laughs> <laughs> yeah you have become one of those people i actually for for christmas because i'm usually so hesitant to play any and all board games with you i literally for for beth's christmas gift i gave her a board game but more importantly, I put on top of it like a like a coupon for me to come and play <laughs> board game night with you guys. Yeah. Sometime. Is there. OK, this could be an interesting topic to explore here on the pop. Is there a reason you think you just don't enjoy like like board games or tabletop games? Goodness. This is something that when Alice and I first started dating, she like self-described herself as like a big board game fan okay and she is a board game fan not in the way that you are like where she would have really loved just just playing like scrabble or monopoly or Mm -hmm. like you know any of the the very very like traditional did i steal board games from alice in the same way you stole harry potter from alice or alice came into my world and lost everything she cared about (laughs) 
I have no idea why she married me. Oh. Um, but no, I think I think that it, in such a big way, like we used to have all these like kind of almost like heated discussions about like how I how I was like kind of adamant that board games are just not something that I do. And she was just like, I just don't get it. Like, why do you not like playing them? It's like, is it because you're like competitive and you're like not good at them? And it's like, and I have I don't honestly know if I have like a good concrete answer other than I think that I grew up with you. Uh. And like, I think growing up, you know, it's like, oh, let's go play Monopoly in the hallway with the pink carpet. Do you remember that? Of course. Yeah. yeah. And that's where we play Monopoly. Yeah. Um, and I think I would just get crushed my whole life. Like right. I always lost. Like, I don't think I knew what it was like to win the game mm. because I think for so long it was just like any time it ever came up, it meant like, well, I'm about to lose. Um, and so... I don't know. I, I think that maybe a lot of what was happening was me not understanding that other people were actively using strategy versus just making like whatever decision seemed like th maybe even the funniest. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, it's like, oh, you landed on boardwalk. Are you going to buy it? It's like, no. Huh. That was a big mistake. <laughs> Joke's on you. You thought I was going to. And now I didn't. Ah, I deceived you. <laughs> <Okay>. right <laughs> right yeah, yeah yeah it's like i think i always wanted to be like unexpected right so like I, I would make those decisions right um and i i don't know that i ever learned how anybody else ever developed their strategies on mm -hmm. how to like be good at these things right um like are you reading books do you just know are you like looking at the, the at the game in like a way that like i'm incapable of doing that you're like breaking down like oh i see what's happening here like you have to own the more property you own the more people can land on it and then you can like tax them more often and like right is that the best tra what is the best strategy for monopoly to this day i don't know it's the reds it's the reds yeah bar boardwalk and park place i'm sure we're gonna get feedback on it are not great investments because they're really expensive and there's only two spots to land on the board and there's like so you have like a one in 20 shot of landing on it okay because there's 40 spots on the board but like the I believe the red properties and maybe the orange properties, which are the ones around the second corner, um, if you can get those, those are really good because the like um, cost to your return on investment is really high. Like it doesn't cost you nearly as much to get all the stuff on them as you will get it back. And if you control those like six spots in particular, then I think and then you've got like six out of 40 or something to land on. What? <laughs> When in life did you learn this lesson? I mean, I've played probably more games of Monopoly than you, uh, but uh, the, I've also, I think, just inadvertently in my travels, I've listened to like various podcasts about Monopoly. Monopoly has a really interesting history behind okay. it in particular that has caused a lot of uh, stories to be told about it. In in like a because I forget what board game company owns Monopoly. It's like Milton. Is it Milton Bradley? Milton or Bradley sounds Hasbro. right. Whatever company it is, basically the original point of Monopoly was to promote like like was like to teach lessons about the dangers of monopolies and to like to promote like the free market and capitalism or whatever. But the inventor of the game, like in a hilarious twist of fate, had like the game like ripped off from her in a very monopoly style way. Oh <laughs> and no then way. The game became about this like cutthroat business. It became about the promotion of this cutthroat business uh as a way to win rather than as a lesson against the thing the game is now about. So So it's literally taking a full 180 because it's taking because, a full 180. Because the objective of the game is to find monopolies. Yeah, the objective of this game is to build monopolies <clears throat> and then screw your opponents out of their money over a slow, long period of time. Um yeah. Well, that is absolutely fascinating. Also, Parker Bros, <laughs> I think, was who had it first, and then Hasbro acquired them. Ah, um, there just, you go. Just for what it's worth, in case probably because are... Hasbro had monopoly on other like board game stuff and forced other people out of the market. Might is be what I'm thinking is something along those games. And I think even anyway, that's that I think is something to the effect of the story of Monopoly, which is like one of the most popular and well-known board games of all time. Isn't it also the case with Monopoly that uh, everybody thinks the Monopoly man had um, a monocle, a monocle, and mm -hmm. he has never had a monocle? He does not. That's like, it, is that a Mandela effect? Is that, that is a Mandela effect. Yeah, it's one of those weird things where people just remember it incorrectly. I think people confuse the Monopoly man and Mr. Peanut a lot because they're both just sort of like wealthy uh, fat cats. Sure, sure. Yeah. 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 
I could see that. Yeah. Do they both have mustaches? I don't think the Mr. Peanut has a mustache, but the Monopoly Man certainly does. Man, this is really blowing my mind. He does yeah. have a monocle, but no mustache. So interestingly, going back to your, like, why you like you feel like I, like, when did I, like, learn to be good at games and stuff? Yes. So I feel like we had, like, this weird effect where um, because, like, you and me and Tyler were all pretty close in age. And could all play together pretty well. Yes. Yes. So we could do that. But I feel like two of my better friends as a uh, young child, whilst they had siblings, they were not close in age. So they were like, they had like an only child effect upon them where they would get to spend tons of alone time doing a thing. Okay. And so I think as a result... They often got very good at stuff because they could just practice it forever without having to like share or compete sure, with anyone. Sure, sure. And so I would go and lose to them, and I would hate it. Like this was—I think this like drove my competitive spirit a lot. Like it would be so frustrating that I could never beat them because then I would come home and I have to split all my time with you and Tyler in a way that they did not have to. Oh, weird. However, given the opportunity to play unlimited stuff, I would go back and destroy them. And it would like drive me like a lot to, to try and be victorious. See, okay, so that's <clears throat> that's what it comes down to though. It's like very early on, you got to a point where you like started valuing the idea of winning because mm -hmm. you were like amongst peers and you were losing to peers on a regular basis. And then you were like, it sort of, gave you the impetus to go and find the answer to the question of how to be good at it. Right. And I think that, like, I, on the other hand, as your younger brother, growing up, I largely just assumed that you were better than me at everything all the time and always. Like, you sure. It, you know, it was like at, at all points in time, we were close in age. We we're like 21 months apart. So... We were old enough to always be doing pretty much the same things. We were, like, on a lot of the same, like, soccer teams, right. basketball teams, yeah. like, stuff like that together. But you, of course, were considerably bigger than I was. That's the thing is I think, yeah, growing up, we were, like, close enough in age to do so much together. But 21 months of life uh, between the ages of, like, 0 and 13 makes a vast difference in your development. Yes. And like size and skill of, the, of almost all things. Right. So I, I think that for me, though, like going back to the board games, it was sort of this thing where not only was I never winning, I really wasn't ever expecting to win either. Mm -hmm. Like, so I generally wasn't disappointed by losing to you because I never really thought I was going to win anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, it was like, do you want to come play this game that you have no shot of winning and then lose. <laughs> right. And it's like, like no. it's like, why would I want to do that? It's yeah. never been fun. Um, and then so I think even now, as as this board game phenomenon has become such a more prominent part of especially your life, but then inadvertently as a part of my life, I think it also sort of ends up being the same thing, like where you're almost always introducing me to any game that I'm ever playing. Mm -hmm. Like you're the person who's explaining the rules to me. And once again, I think as an adult, I'm not finding myself in the position of expecting to win. Right. Because it's like, well, he's beaten me ever since I was a kid. <laughs> and and so, he, he already knows the rules that I've learned on the fly. Yes. Sure. So, okay. Now, I think we have an opportunity here to bring our conversation full circle. Oh, boy. Because I think we can actually segue this. There was one point in time in our life where again we were we we're continuing to do things where we're, we're i don't even know if competing with one another is the right thing but like as we stepped into the world of cross country mm -hmm. you started running you actually just sort of decided i think mom describes it as like the proudest moment of her life the day that you came home with like the, the cross country flyer where she was right. just like so excited that you on your own had gone and done that because she was like a track runner. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, she when she was. That. Yeah. When she was younger. So yeah. I think she never wanted to force it on us. But then you just sort of went out and like chose to do it. Right. So you started in your ninth grade year mm -hmm. uh, running. And then I think by the time you were. Let's see here. When you were in 10th grade, I started as an eighth grader. Mm hmm. 
still at this point in my life, I'm basically once again joining a sport sort of because you did it. Like right. I'm, I'm sort of coming on the heels of like, like I've always looked back on it. I'm like, I don't know that I would have picked cross, cross country. country out right. of the lineup, but like, like a lot of the people you knew and your friends and I was friends with you anyway. So I was like, well, I want to go do the thing my big brother does. So once again, you know, we start doing this thing together. And then by the time I am going into my sophomore year and you are a senior, I think for the very first time in my life, I that that I am like readily aware of as a thing where we were both trying. I like beat you at something. Mm -hmm. OK, so. It was literally and it was like a sprint to the finish. Right. So like to say that I beat you, we were literally like, I think I was like a length, a, a human length ahead of you. Right. Like we sprinted to in, into the finish line. Um, this is one of those things where I think we can go back to taking over someone's hobby mm -hmm. where all of a sudden, like maybe the thing that had started as your thing mm -hmm. slowly like got shifted. Uh, that is a good question. I have thought about that exact situation before because the I, I know that situation was always like really clouded in my mind because the other thing that happened was that earlier that week I had like really rolled my ankle like right, on a morning run right because so we're, we're at we're at Appalachian State University which right. is like in the mountains of Boone North Carolina yeah. and we're like running on trails so it's like you, you had definitely taken a fall like two days prior right like a 10 mile run yeah so i think like in my mind i was like i wasn't sure like i and I, I i just don't know going back into that moment like i think in the moment i was like you know it, it this weird mix of emotions of like being really happy that like obviously you had like done really well mm -hmm. but then also feeling a little like upset that i had lost but then also not sure if i'd lost because i was injured but you know or, or like was i willing to admit to myself that i was just slower or sure. something and i just i don't really know um I, I don't know if that like built some sort of mental block that like oh okay i'm i am not the faster person or something sure you know like this is the way it, the ugh, running is so mental anyway oh it is it's like oh it is. you know I, 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 it's it's very difficult i think to to know exactly like uh, like if if you didn't beat me in that race, would I have just like gone on to become like a faster person, or would you have never thought you could? Or I I don't know. Oh, I know, and and it's so funny because I actually have such a, a similar experience with this whole thing where um, going into that year. So as a as a ninth grade runner, and the way that that cross country teams work is that they're teams of seven. So you have your varsity squad, which is mm -hmm. the one through seven. Yeah. The JV squad, which is eight through fourteen, and then. Because cross country is an incredibly inclusive sport, basically anyone else who wants to run is just on JV and they just score the top seven finishers. Right. Realistically, they score the top, top five. And the um, six, seven are there for tiebreakers, which almost never comes into play. Right. Yeah. Very, very unusual. But you can happen. push other runners back in their score, I guess, is the other half of the strategy. Whatever. Not important. Right, right, right. Yeah, there are strategies to it. Um, but so my ninth grade year, I was like a 15th 16th person on this team and then in my 10th grade year i jumped to the seventh person on the team right so i had this weird thing happen where, where i've always felt the exact same way as what you just described where i basically jumped the jv squad entirely right so i went from being basically back of the pack in the jv races to being back of the pack in the varsity races right and so for me, like I never got that experience of getting to like run out front and right. like like I, I could have won every JV race, but instead I came in 80th in every varsity race. Right. It's like, would you did did it like just set in your mind that like I run kind of towards the back of the race? Exactly. Like it right. would be inappropriate for me <clears throat> to be like in a front position. Right. Yeah. Mm. Weird. I know it Running's is weird. Hard. <laughs> it is hard. It is hard. Oh my gosh. So anyway, I, I don't. I don't know if that if that capped off our our full full segment here the way that I was hoping for. But I still think it's interesting to have talked about it either way. Yeah. Um, for my question for everybody out there today, I want to know your experience with board games. I mm. want to know what it has been like. Are you like good at them amongst your friends? Are you the type of person who knows if you're playing a specific game? Do you seek out a strategy 
for that game. Mm -hmm. Like, it, like how often? I feel like you always have a strategy. I do. Yes. Like, That's, so you. This is okay. I will say that I, there was a time in college where I had a group of friends and we played a lot of board games, and uh, the same thing happened where I would typically win, and. It would drive them all bananas. Yeah. Like, yeah. They, <laughs> and it was, I never knew how to explain it. They're like, they would say that I was too competitive. And this, uh, I, I even now have trouble rationalizing such an argument. Cause I'm like, like, like being more trying to win though. Right. Like right? if, if anything, being more competitive would seem like the type of thing that would cloud your judgment versus being a less competitive person who is simply sticking to their strategy, which I think is an interesting thing when it comes to board games, that having a strategy, period, yeah. is like putting you eons above the average person. That is normally how it goes, I have found. So, yeah, like I felt like their argument was like, it's okay to want to win. It's not okay to try and win. Oh, sure. You know? And it sure. was like, of course, everyone wants to win but that's not the reason we're playing. And I'm like, yes, it is. Uh, that is the, what do you, uh, uh, people anyway. Why are we here? I know. I know. Mm, mm. So anyway, that is often, I find the, the, the case is that if you have even a base level medium, I'm trying the strategy at all. That will almost always oust people who are just playing. Sure. Like even if you're inexperienced, if you just shoot, like it might turn out that your strategy is flimsy and real, basic and that a more experienced player would just trounce you but often if you can just pick up something early that you know works that'll get you through the game pretty well i think i think you're exactly right and i, and I can tell you 110 percent that when i am playing games i'm typically not so i don't think that i'm so focused on the game that I'm actively thinking like, oh, I see you're supposed to be collecting the resources because the resources allow you to do the thing and the thing allows you to do the other thing. And like all of a sudden, like it all comes together. Like, right. I, I think for me, it's I'm usually going on much more of a like, oh, the spotlight's on me. It's my it's my turn to go. Yeah. OK, let me roll those dice. Oh, a nine. Great. Yeah, I will take three vegetables, please. <laughs> it's like, cool. Uh, now I've got vegetables. <laughs> Just in case you never know when you're going to need vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> and it could be the case. It's like, dude, if you had gotten like the nine to blooms, then you would have had enough to crack open the chest of Easton von Favia day. Yeah, right. Meanwhile, everyone else, then, then it's my turn and everyone's like, Ben, why'd you get vegetables? And they're like, was that bad? And it's like, yeah, everyone saw Jay get the steel vegetables card, and all he needs is three vegetables to win the game. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So maybe what's really happening is that you're, not only are you implementing a minimal strategy, everyone else is just dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, of course I'm going to take advantage of people who bought got vegetables instead of doubloons. <laughs> Boy, what game is this we're playing? <laughs> vegetables and doubloons. It's, it's like, it's like produce pirates. <laughs> produce pirates. The the vegetarian pirates of the high sea. <laughs> That's right. Of course, once you get into the world of board games, then you'll start having other people who are always also trying to win. Yes. In like a very active way. And I, I, there are certain games I'll play where you can tell like, me and like we'll invite another couple over and like me and the other husband are like really intent and like you could just i can like look at him and just tell like oh, he's doing all the same math i am and <laughs> he's like he knows to take these or not to take these or what he can or cannot take because of how it'll benefit me and our wives will just be like talking <laughs> right, dude, just... and the, the game will end and all of a sudden we'll have this like entire huge conversation about all the different strategies and they're like oh god you guys are trying a lot harder than us <laughs> <laughs> do you do you ever find because this happens to me sometimes where i'm like i am aware of the fact that i could screw a fellow player over but it's like our buddy's wife and it's like i can't do it to that person like like i could be mean to you or like playfully to ally or something like that but like like I, I can't be mean to this person I don't know. No, no, Ben. Let me encourage you to be mean to that person. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because first of all, 
this is a great way to get to know that person is what I found is that often the really like <laughs> meek, quiet, way too innocent person, like the act of being aggressive towards them will like awaken their personality. A lot of times I have found so like you're... it will engage them more in the game and with you. We got to see what they're made of. Exactly. Like they're good because they're almost like, here's the thing. They're expecting to be treated that way because that's the way they're always trot. Yes. Yes. But you got to break that mold for them. But is that the past tense of treated yeah. is trot? I don't know if that's accurate, but I think everyone knows what I'm mont. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what you mont. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I think we've talked about this for uh, far long enough. Uh, please let us know your experience with board games. Are you like super competitive or are you just like there to have fun like a loser? No. <laughs> So, I mean, it's not like a loser. They're just going to lose. <laughs> What's the difference, Ben? What's the difference? No, no, there's no wrong way to play. No wrong way to play as long as you're having fun. It's all about getting people together in the same exactly. place and having having an activity to facilitate conversation. Exactly. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. If you'd like to send any of your feedback about the pop, you can do so by sending it to popcornculturepod at gmail.com. You can leave a review on this podcast. You can go and find our Facebook group online, Popcorn Culture, uh, and be sure to just keep sparking conversation conversation it gives us more to talk about and a better way to interact with you guys yeah until next time bye pop pop